Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast with another segment, another week of the weekly news with the only man that can bring this the news is Nick Bendel. Good morning, good day. There is no other person in the entire world who is able to bring this news other than me. Of course, there is no other. And um, so glad to glad to have you back. It's um, what is in the news this week, Nick? Um, well, firstly, what's in the news for you this week? Mm, well, uh I mean, I, I hate to make it all about me, but let's talk about me for a bit. Yes. Well, we always like to start. You know, it's you bring us the news. So um, I, I've got to give you um, um, a, a little bit of a, um, a stage here. Well, thank you very much. For those who don't know, I own a business called Hunter and Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. And one group we like to work with is accountants. We have quite a few accountant clients. Uh, personally, I'm, I just find uh, I'm one of these sad people who finds tax and business very interesting. And one of our accountant clients was kind enough to leave us a very generous Google review. Hunter and Scribe have been providing blogs and social media posts to my accounting firm for almost two years. I barely have to lift a finger because they think of all the topics and write the content for me. They understand accounting and business very well, so I never have to explain accounting regulations or business principles to them. Also, they keep across all the latest news, which I'm, which means I'm able to share this valuable information with my audience in a timely manner. Very nice of that particular accountant to leave such a generous review. Very good. Well done. It's um, But uh, I already knew this of you, Nick, but uh, I'm glad it, we can share it with everyone else. Well, that is very kind of you. And what have you and Leefield been up to in the past week? Well, the past week, uh, been very busy. Um, uh, lots happening. We've um, got new staff, which I think I mentioned last time, that um, is um, starting with us and uh, are doing great things. So I'm very grateful uh, for having good people in our business. Um, uh, and But on the other side of the ledger of good people in our business are our business partners, and um, we looks like um, we will have another city in North Queensland opening up for us soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and with a a good long-standing local sales agent who specialises mm. just in doing sales, and but wants to add property management to um, his business, and uh, and that's what we uh, provide that option to um, businesses like that, licensed agents who uh, want to add a property management business, as we're a hundred percent outsource solution for them to do so. So stay tuned. Um, hopefully, we can announce it next week of the opening up of a um, fairly large North Queensland city. So. Um, yeah. Yes, so glad to be there. But apart from that, uh, we have um, another buyer's agent who's joined us recently who is buying all across the country. And, um, oh, and I was speaking to doing a presentation earlier in the week to a, uh, a, a property group. They're a development group with a lot of members uh, in Melbourne, but they've recently started up in Sydney. So I was doing a presentation um, uh, last week to them about where to find the best rental yields in 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 the country. So um, that was an interesting conversation. Very nice. You have had a busy week. Yes, has been. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's get into the news, Nick. What have we What have we got for us this week? Well, our first story: negative gearing is back in the news. Oh. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has conceded he asked his department to model the impact of changes to negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions. When it comes to negative gearing changes, it is not unusual at all for governments or for treasurers to get advice on contentious issues which are in the public domain, including in the parliament, Treasurer Chambers, uh, Chalmers said. It is not unusual for treasurers to do that, but we have made it very clear that we have a broad and ambitious housing policy already, and those changes aren't part of it. Bill Shorten, who proposed eliminating negative gearing during the 2019 election when he was opposition leader, said on the Today Show, 
the Prime Minister has been crystal clear it's not Labor's policy. I'm very sure we're not taking our 2019 policies to the 2025 election. Owen, you are a man who says it like it is. Should the government eliminate negative gearing? No. <laughs> do I need to say much more? I mean, how many times do we need to go over this time and time again? It's <laughs> it's um, uh, It was a Labor government um, in the 80s with Hawke and Keating who brought it in after they famously eliminated it. Um, and what happened when they eliminated it? Lots of investors sold their properties because they couldn't afford to keep them and rents started going up um, and there was a lack of supply. So there was a huge, huge um, uh, demand for public housing. So uh, uh, state governments as well as federal governments who provided um, uh, public housing um, said they needed to do something to um, do it. Now, um, to give a bit of a history, um, when um, John Howard was in, in power, um, who was a, a Liberal Prime Minister, just in case someone didn't realise, uh, um, he he actually watered down the negative gearing um, benefits uh, th through uh, depreciation benefits. Now, uh, so from there, we went to Malcolm Turnbull, who then watered down the, the negative gearing ben benefits uh, through depreciation benefits even more so. So we, we're now left with, yes, negative gearing, um, if it does happen as a property investor, um, and that sh should never be uh, the reason to buy a property where you can get um, tax benefits. but. Um, if it does happen where you do make a loss on the property, if you can uh, claim that loss as a tax deduction, um, then that makes a huge benefit to actually keep the property and not kick tenants out because you need to sell it. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's um, th there's no benefit to getting rid of it. Hmm. Okay, let me throw a counter argument at you. Doesn't no, negative no. gearing worsen housing affordability and, and therefore make it harder for first home buyers to enter the market? Um I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's the number of properties. So the number of investment properties out there are about a third of all properties. The number of properties, uh, uh, the number of those that would be actually negatively geared would be so small. It's such a small percentage of the housing market that is actually negatively geared. It would have a minuscule um, amount of difference on housing affordability. So you, then... you're, talking, you're talking maybe... 5% at most of all properties um, that would be negatively geared as investment properties. So it's um, uh, so to say that it's having this huge effect on the property market, it's like, no, the, the, the segment of the market that makes the biggest difference on prices going up um, is the secondary market. So people who already own properties and are selling them, and they're um, either um, downsizing or upsizing. Okay, well, let me put a, a, another counter-argument. Uh, if we're saying that getting rid of negative gearing wouldn't really affect affordability, uh, is, is there any problem then with getting rid of it? I mean, uh, if it's not really going to have much of an impact, well, why should we worry? the people it will affect most are the renters who need a property to live uh, and they and, and we need more supply so it's so if we take more properties out of the rental pool then it's going to make the rental affordability crisis 
uh, even worse. Well, the good news about negative gearing is that it pops up in the media every year or two. So I look forward to us having this exact same conversation in 12 to 24 months. Oh, it's, but it's been overdone. It's just like if, 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 you know, it, it's just common sense now of, of why it's there. And um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's been overdone. It's, I, I, I wish the topic could get dropped because it's just a, it, it's, a all of the benefits are out wide uh, are, are outweighed by uh, a lot of the um, negatives of owning a property now. So anyway, yes, let's move on. <laughs> Temporarily, because we will revisit this in 12 or 24 months. I know oh, it's for sure. Never mind. Our second story today, Owen, inflation falls, but 2024 rate cut unlikely. Headline inflation, remember those words, headline inflation, fell from 3.5% in July to 2.7% in August, marking the first time since 2021 that headline inflation has been within the Reserve Bank's target range of 2 to 3%. However, while headline inflation fell from 35 to 2.7%, trimmed mean inflation fell from only 3.8% to 3.4%. The Reserve Bank regards the trimmed mean inflation indicator as the more accurate of the two because it removes volatile items from the inflation calculations. The day before the inflation data was released, the Reserve Bank decided to leave the cash rate unchanged at 4.35% and again made clear it was determined to do whatever needed to be done to defeat inflation. Speaking at a press conference after the decision, Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock said, the message clearly from the board is that in the near term, it does not see interest rate cuts. Owen, now that headline inflation is within the Reserve Bank's target range of two to 3%, should the Reserve Bank be cutting rates? Um, no, I don't believe so. Um, every, everyone would uh, wish they would. Uh, for for personal reasons, um, but from the greater macroeconomic point of view, uh, no, uh, there's no reason for them to cut um, uh, interest rates yet, um, especially when you look at uh, the trimmed mean inflation rate. Uh, so we need to get it um, both figures to below to um, below three percent, and. Um, before we can even think about uh, cutting rates. Mm. Oh, so so what, what's the danger of cutting rates too early? Uh, the, dan- the main danger is inflation spiking again. Um, yeah, people will get relaxed um, and think, oh, cool, I can go out and spend more money now. Um, and uh, that pushes inflation up. And then we have more, yeah, and then we have more and more people wanting to push wages up, and then we're getting this vicious cycle where, um, yes, we, we need to have, um, we we can't have inflation continuing to go up and up um, every month and every quarter. Otherwise, uh, if we have uh, wages continue to go, go up, uh, we, we'll, we'll never get control of it. Uh, most people would be aware that the U.S. Federal Reserve recently made its first rate cut, in and and this was the first rate cut in four years. Interestingly, though, Owen, the rate cut came after the Fed had been signalling for several months that it was going to cut rates. The Reserve Bank, though, has not given any indication that a rate cut is coming. So, is it possible that Australia's first rate cut might? occur later than a lot of commentators believe? You never know. I, I think uh, the Reserve Bank is not wanting to um, predict the future. Uh, I mean, it, even a group of economists trying to predict what's going to happen in the next three months, trying to get them to uh, all agree on that is a difficult thing. So uh, you can really only 
you know, predict within the next three months of what might happen. Uh, so in six months' time, who knows? It's um, anything can happen. Well, let's leave interest rates for the moment. Uh, but this, of course, is a developing story, and I know we're going to keep talking about it over the next few months. Our final I'd prefer story... to talk about interest rates than negative gearing anytime. <laughs> well, interest rates are more of an ongoing story. Negative gearing is one of those stories that pops back up every year or two. So uh, negative gearing, I think, is disappearing for now, but it will come back. Okay. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Our final story for today, Economist slams housing for super idea. Economist Saul Leslake has rubbished the coalition's plan to allow first-home buyers to use up to 40% of their superannuation to buy a property, calling it, quote, a thoroughly bad idea. Eslake says there's 60 years of evidence proving that anything that allows buyers to pay more for housing, including letting buyers tap into their super, quote, results in more expensive housing rather than in a higher proportion of Australians owning housing. And that's because, according to Eslake, government assistance schemes increase demand, but not supply. To quote Eslake, home ownership has been declining steadily since 1966, he said. It's not a coincidence that the decline in home ownership started just after the introduction of the first homeowners grant in 1964. Owen, should first home buyers be able to access a superannuation or is Saul S. Lake right to call it a thoroughly bad idea? Yes, I don't think it's a good idea. It's um, it's uh, something, as, as he's rightly said, it just fuels demand. Um, it's your super is supposed to be there for retirement um, to invest for the future. If you want to get into the property market with your super, uh, there's options to be able to do that by buying an investment property in your super fund. So uh, that option is already there. It works well and it can allow you to get into the property market using your super, um, but um, trying to buy a house using super where it doesn't earn an income, uh, where it, um, so it doesn't qualify as, as an investment. So um, unless they were to come up with some kind of strange rule that would allow you to um, uh, effectively pay rent to your super, um, but they've made it pretty clear up till now that uh, even if you bought an investment property in your in your super, you could never use it yourself for any reason. So it's um, yeah, there, there's uh, there's rules around this for for a reason. It has been for for a long time. So um, uh, yes, we need to focus on the basics, which was um, as uh, Saul S. Lake has said, we need to increase supply. That will be the only way that we bring prices down. Mm, okay, you've anticipated my next question. Oh, sorry. If, <laughs> if, if superannuation isn't going to help us increase the rate of home ownership, what can governments do to increase the rate of home ownership in Australia? Yep, as, as um, Saul has said uh, there, it's increasing supply. Um, prices um, have only gone up since governments have... Uh, got their fingers into um, uh, giving out uh, money for people to be able to get into their house. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it, it, they need to focus on supply. And I know we've discussed this quite a few times, but how can government get supply to increase? Uh, there's a number of ways. It's... Um, uh, there's there's tax reform, um, which would uh, with uh, the state taxes of uh, stamp duty and uh, land tax, uh, where they can make it easier for um, turnover in stock uh, of properties, so that people can buy and sell easily uh, or easier, um, which will make a a more mobile uh, population from uh, dwelling to dwelling. And it's um, so it, so that would mean that you would see people buying and selling more often 
because they wouldn't have this huge tax burden um, and it would make them easier to be able to move. So, and that would that would give us a more mobile workforce as well, I think. Um, so, which adds other other benefits to um, um, uh, to the country. And on top of that, then there's the red tape involved with getting projects approved, whether it's land subdivisions, uh, whether it's um, getting uh, new developments approved. Uh, yes, everything needs to be approved correctly, uh, but at the moment there is so much red tape that slows it down and makes it more difficult. Uh, the other uh, part of that is uh, changing the way that taxes are charged for these new developments. Yes, councils, um, local council, as well as uh, state governments um, need to raise taxes from these new developments to be able to pay for infrastructure. Um, but the way they're paid and the, the way that money is charged can be done in different ways. And so if the government wants to make it easier to increase supply and by using some way of, of um, uh, using tax benefits, it can be in uh, helping to make uh, the supply easier uh, using tax benefits. Hmm, I, I feel very good about our discussion, Owen. We've educated the government about housing supply and negative gearing. We've educated the coalition around super for housing. We've educated the Reserve Bank on the timing of their first rate cut. I'm pretty sure that Michelle Bullock and Dutton and Albanese do listen to this podcast. So I think that's going to have a very positive impact on public policy. You never know. One day, um, hopefully, they're uh, listening. And but um, it's the uh, public opinion piece that will will get them uh, elected. That will uh, probably decide what their choices are. It's amazing. We provide so much value to our nation's leaders and decision makers, and yet we do this all for free. Yes. Well, it's um, been a lifetime of knowledge accumulation and experience. So, um, yeah, yeah, we have to put it out there somehow, Nick. Well, it is a delight talking to you, Owen. Really enjoyed this week's chat, and I look forward to chatting again next week. Thank you, Nick. And, um, yes, please, everyone, join us again next week for the weekly news. Mm -hmm.